Hey, what's up everyone? If you have not yet seen the announcement trailer or accompanying gameplay for The Outer Worlds, you're fucking up. I've left links to both videos in the description below, so definitely check that out. But for those of you who are unfamiliar and may be thinking, huh, The Outer Worlds, that sounds like a good name for a space documentary on Netflix narrated by Neil deGrasse Tyson, you may be surprised to find out that this is actually the new sci-fi RPG being developed by Obsidian. And yes, it is the same Obsidian that developed Fallout New Vegas. And on top of that, Obsidian has tapped Tim Kane. No, no not that Tim Kane, this Tim Kane, along with Leonard Boyarsky, two of the original creators of Fallouts 1 and 2. Now, before I get into all of the reasons that I'm excited for this game so early on, as well as why Bethesda maybe should be concerned about this, I do need to leave the disclaimer that, yes, this game is not being released until next year. We only have an announcement trailer and about 15 minutes of gameplay. So while I am very excited, I'm also painfully aware that there have been plenty of times in the past where a trailer or a gameplay demo got me real hyped up, only to disappoint me upon the game's actual release. There's one example that shall not be named that's especially top of mind, and it's a bit of a sensitive area right now, but y you might know what I'm talking about. That said, I've already got plenty of reasons to be cautiously optimistic this far ahead of a game's release, and while plenty of people have already dissected the gameplay and the background for the game, one of the biggest sources of hope for me has been reading the interviews with Tim Kaine and Leonard Boyarsky, who I mentioned earlier. Back when Kaine and Boyarsky tackled the original Fallout, they set out with the goal to put things in this game that were not present in any game that had existed before. And looking back at how the original Fallout was received relative to all the other games being released at the time and the influence it's had even to this day, I would say they succeeded. And the great news is that Obsidian has given Kane and Boyarsky that same level of creative control. They have the green light to do whatever they want, and they have already stated that much like back in the late 90s, they want to do something with this game and put things in it that we aren't seeing right now in other RPGs. Without dissecting the Kane and Boyarsky interviews too much, there were two things that really stood out to me. When asked how much things like industry trends and audience demands factor into how they approach a game, they pretty much said, nah, we make a game that we think will be fun, and then we put it out there, and hopefully other people think it's fun too. And while that's not to say that I think fans should be ignored when developing a game, I also think that if you're aiming to create something groundbreaking, that hasn't been done before or feels very unfamiliar, if you're going by industry trends or what audiences want, they're only thinking of things that already exist. So you're just going to create something that feels like a refreshed or adjusted version of something that's out there rather than something totally new. On the same topic, Kane and Boyarsky also talked about something like combat and their acknowledgement that they're not going to create a combat system that feels as good and fluid as Call of Duty because Call of Duty is strictly a shooter. Their priority is to make a great RPG and then figure out ways of how they can make combat feel fun. And while we'll need to wait to see how that actually comes to life in the full game, my initial reaction is thank fucking god. Without naming names, it really feels like there have been an increasing number of quote-unquote RPGs in recent years that actually dumbed down the role-playing aspects and the character development and progression and player choice in favor of making the combat feel more natural and engaging. And what that leads to is a game that doesn't feel like a truly immersive RPG where you are fully in control of playing the game and being the character you want to be. And fortunately, at this point, we have good reason to believe that will not be the case with The Outer Worlds. Two final things I want to note from these interviews are about just that player choice, as well as ethics and morals, something that in particular felt dumbed down or limited in recent Fallout games in particular, where in Fallout 3 and New Vegas, karma was a huge factor. And then Fallout 4, no, no, that's that's not a thing. I mean, there are factions, some will like you, some won't, but karma, nah, if you're a bad guy, it just depends who you're bad to. Now, while I certainly hope that we don't just see a copy-paste of the karma system from older Fallouts with a different name in the Outer Worlds, because that would kind of go against their whole idea of trying to do things that are different and new, we do know that morals and 
giving players the choice to be what kind of character they want to be is very top of mind for the developers of this game. And we can see this playing out in a number of ways between the gameplay demo and the interviews, whether it be the very Fallout 3, Fallout New Vegas-esque dialogue system where you got the head-on camera shot and you see the full sentences that you have the option to say, all of which are very different as far as what kind of tone you're setting, whether you're being friendly or hostile. It's a big aspect that can really contribute to a game feeling unique to you as the player. The fact that you're in control of every step of the way, especially with something like dialogue where it can affect what relationships you have with other characters in the game and what opportunities come up down the road. And another important aspect directly related to dialogue that they call out in the interviews is that there is no voice actor for your character. This is big because as we can see in the difference between Fallout 3 and Fallout 4, for example, having a voice actor not only means you have to be more limited with the dialogue options you give players, but it also means you have a fixed and static personality or tone throughout the game, whether you're being an asshole and trying to be a bad guy and killing people and just the worst person in the world, or if you're trying to be super helpful and friendly, having a fixed voice actor that you have no control over can really take you out of that. And while dialogue is very important and one of the most top of mind ways that a developer can give a player freedom and choice throughout a game, the actual quests having very different outcomes based on if you're being good or bad is also huge and something we have already confirmed from the opening quest of the game, where without going into too many details, and if you watch the demo that I left in the description, you'll be able to get a hint at that for yourself, but you can either help this guy find a cure for some people who are frozen on the ship that you arrive on, or you can turn in that guy to what are essentially the authorities, which would be the quote-unquote bad karma choice. The game starts off by launching you into a decision like that where you're already setting the tone for what kind of character you want to be in this world. While I'd love to keep talking about all of the reasons I'm excited for this game and why I think we should be very optimistic based on what we've heard this early on, I'm going to leave it there. Let me know in the comments what you think, why you're excited, or if you have any thoughts that I didn't even cover in this. And before I finish up, I need to take one moment to talk about none other than Bethesda. Now normally the release of an upcoming RPG wouldn't really mean anything to Bethesda and their loyal supporters, but between Fallout 76's iffy reception and questionable post-launch support, we also have the very relevant factor that this game is being made by a prior developer of a well-received game in the Fallout franchise, not to mention it's being directed by the original creators of Fallout's 1 and 2. The short answer to the question of should Bethesda be worried is it depends how they're going to react. I think the more straightforward and I guess easier thing that I'd want them to address in the future, especially with a project like Elder Scrolls 6, which is going to have a huge amount of hype and enormous expectations, is how they approach the game. Are they trying to make it even more accessible to general players who maybe aren't super into RPGs and need a combat system that's especially engaging and can compete with non-RPG games, or are they going to try to go back to their roots and build a great RPG from the ground up and then figure out how to make combat fun and unique? What's probably even more important than that though, and this is the thing they've been getting a ton of heat for since Fallout 76's release, is they got to move on from the creation engine. They've already said that they're going to be using it again for Starfield and Elder Scrolls 6, and oh boy, does that put a nasty taste in my mouth to hear. I get that Starfield is probably too late in the development process to do anything about, but assuming the Elder Scrolls 6 is early on, I'd rather get the game a year or two later on a new or at least severely revamped engine then get it on the same glitchy, unstable one we've received the past few games on. The creation engine served its purpose great for Skyrim, and even to some degree for Fallout 4, but by today's standards, it's no longer up to par, and the glitches and stability issues are really extreme compared to the industry standard these days. The fact that there are pieces of code, and therefore glitches, that date back as far as Morrowind present in the creation engine is extremely concerning. And it clearly is not able to handle a multiplayer game, which 
again, oh, I am praying the Elder Scroll Six is not multiplayer. Fingers crossed. Bethesda, I swear, don't do it. Don't do it. Learn from your mistakes. But even if it's not multiplayer, the creation engine needs to go or it needs to be revamped to an extreme level. Because these days, the amount of glitches and errors that show up in Bethesda games is no longer acceptable. With Fallout 3, New Vegas, and Skyrim, it was. But even with them, I think part of the reason we cut Bethesda so much slack was because those games were so great and so groundbreaking at the time that, like, okay, I can suffer a few graphics or physics glitches that really any other developer would be mortified to find in their game. But nowadays, especially with the expectations set by Fallout 4 and to a lesser degree Fallout New Vegas, if they're not pushing the boundaries on the RPG genre, then the games at least need to run seamlessly. Otherwise, I'm concerned Bethesda's future might not be as bright as Todd Howard would lead you to believe. Alright, that's all I really wanted to say on that. You could go even further with why Bethesda should potentially be concerned by the Outer Worlds, but I'd imagine they've already got enough on their plate with Fallout 76 and the laundry list of issues they need to address with that. Let me know what you guys think. Are you as pumped as I am? Is there anything else you want to see or hear about this game that has yet to be revealed? And what are your thoughts on what this might mean for Bethesda, especially given who's developing the game? Uh, thanks for watching. Leave a like if you enjoyed this video, and I will see you next time.